All right, so now we have a main class that is basically um, simulating one player poking the other continuously. And in the player class, we have the ability to poke somebody. We have the ability to use a patient's pack. Uh, we have the ability to output some customized information about the class. And we have a customized constructor that allows you to set the name and randomizes the other data about the, uh, about the player. The next thing we need to do is create the game scenario where we would take turns. So in this situation, instead of just constantly poking the enemy, we should play the game as long as the enemy's patience is greater than zero and my patience is greater than zero. So as long as both of us have non-zero patience values, then we can take turns poking each other. So I'll set it up so that the enemy pokes me and we print out my stats. Now we're going to have the players poking each other and at the end we need to know who won. So since at this point one of us is going to have a patience of zero because either this condition or this condition was false, then I can tell by just checking which of those players has a patience of zero. So if my patience is zero, then I know that Mr. Pearson won. Otherwise, I know that I won. Let's run that and see how that goes. Okay, so we can walk through this game. And see everybody's patience draining. Now, as you look at this, you can see that it's kind of tricky to tell um, who's doing what, what's happening, because all the text is kind of jammed together. So this is where you could go in and you could clean things up a little bit. And down here at the end, something interesting happens. You can see that Mr. Pearson's patience is zero. And then my patience goes to zero, and so Mr. Pearson wins. So what this means is that after Mr. Pearson's patience went to zero, he was allowed to take another poke. Both of us went down to zero. And the reason Mr. Pearson won was because I check my patient's value first. So even though both of us got to zero, this is what happened. So what we need to do in here is we need to check, before we go on to poke, uh, have the enemy poke me back, we need to check if the enemy's patience is greater than zero. Now we could say if the enemy's patience is greater than zero, then run these lines. A slightly simpler thing to do would be to say if the enemy's patience is less than or equal to zero, of course we know it can't get less than, but this is not a bad safeguard just in case something goes wrong. If the enemy's patience is less than or equal to zero, what we really want to do is we want to break out of the loop. And then we don't need to do this. Now you'll notice there I put the break right after, uh, but by using Alt Shift F to format it, it automatically will enter in the brackets and the break. So that's the um, that's the keystroke I use from time to time, where it sort of automatically seems to format stuff. It's uh, up here somewhere. Uh, format. Now I'm on an Apple, so it's Control Shift F, but on a PC or a Linux machine, it's uh, Alt Shift F to format. All right, let's try that again. All right, so now you can see the progress. And down here you can see that uh, a poke 
drains 24 patients from Mr. Pearson, his patience goes down to zero, and he doesn't get the opportunity to poke me back. Uh, so that's what we want to have happen. Now obviously this still isn't ideal because you don't get to choose whether you want to use a patient's pack or whether you want to poke the enemy. So we're going to need to enter in a little bit of logic into the game to allow you to take turns doing these sorts of things and making these kinds of choices. It'd also be nice if we could clean up the way the output looks because right now it's really not very good. So we'll take a minute to do that. Instead of just printing out the number representing patients, it would be fun to have a visual representation, like a something that you could see that really showed you how much patience a person had left. So what we could do is, instead of printing out the number, we could print out a string, um, some text. The size of the text could represent how much patience the person had left. So let me show you a way that we could do that. So we can use the new keyword to create a string and make that string made up of a character array. And basically we want that character array to be the same size as the amount of patients a person has left. So what this is going to do is create a new string that is the same size, it's an array of characters, that is the length of the person's uh, current patients. What that does is creates an array where each character in the array is basically a null uh, character or um, an empty character. And what we can then do is say to that string, well I want you to replace every occurrence of that empty character, and this is new, you probably didn't know about this, slash zero represents that null character. I want you to replace every instance of that with, I don't know, whatever character we decide means health. So we might use the uh, asterisk, for example. Okay, so this is a long bit of code and it's a completely new concept, but basically this is a really quick way to create a string of a certain size with a certain character in it. So now instead of adding the patient's value to the string, I'm going to add this new patient string that I created. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Okay, so now you can see that we get this long string of asterisks, and as the game goes on, the asterisks go down and down and down, and you can see them getting closer to zero until finally you see Mr. Pearson has no patience asterisks anymore. It's still not uh, a very good interaction in terms of seeing who's doing what to who, so we need to uh, clean up this section a little bit here. So the scenario here is that the description of what's happening will be a little bit better. And then we will print out every single time both player statuses. So this might make the game a little easier to uh, a little easier to understand. And I'm also going to put in some space here between each attempt. Now we still don't have the ability for players to make a decision. But we'll add that in in a second. Let's just add a new line right here. This is looking a little bit better. After each poke, you see the results. There we go. OK. Now we still don't have the ability to control what happens. So we'll need to add that in as well. But the question now becomes, should the main method be in control of that interaction in terms of what the player does? Or should the player class be in charge of what that interaction looks like? Well, let's just take a look at what it would look like if we did it in here. So. And by the way, I'm going to just print out how 
how the players start out. Okay, so I'm going to ask the user what they'd like to do. Um, I need to have access to a scanner to actually get their input. Now it doesn't make sense really to define my scanner inside this loop, so I'm going to take this scanner and I'm going to define it <coughs> at the top of my main method. I could define it globally up here if I wanted to, but um, I'm not doing anything except using my main method, so I'll just leave it in there. So Now I need to get the user's choice for what they want to do. And now I need to act based on that. So if the user choice is a P, then I want to poke the enemy. Else if the user's choice is a U, I want to use a patience pack for that user. And I might want to print out that the user used a patience pack. Now there's a problem with this because I don't know if I was able to use a patience pack. All I know is I tried, but I don't know if I had enough. So there's a couple ways we could get around this. We could only do this action if um, the user had enough patience packs. We could have the use patience pack method tell us whether it was successful or not and use that as our condition. So let's take a look at that option because that requires us not to redo the functionality that's in the use patience pack method. Because right now here it, it only works if there are uh, more patience packs than zero. So instead of this being void, let's make it a boolean. Better yet, let's make it an integer and we can keep track of uh, how many patience points the user gained from using this patience pack. And if the user gained zero, then we know that uh, this uh, this was not successfully uh, run because the user didn't have any patience packs left. So, if they do have patience packs, I'm going to return the number of points that their score went up by. Otherwise, I'm going to return zero. And so I should comment what this means here. So now if I go back here, if the user chooses to use a, a patience pack, what I can do is store that value. And if that value is zero, I can print out a message like, an apology. Otherwise, I can actually describe how many patience points the person went up by. So let's try this out. So 
So here I'm going to try to use a patience pack. And you can see right up here, I got this message, Mr. Prowse gained 49 patience points. And now I have three patience packs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use all my patience packs and just see what happens when I get down to no patience packs. Alright, so when I try to use this patience pack, I should get an error message. Here we go. Sorry, no patience packs left. And that's okay. I'll just start poking now that I've upped my patience. Now you can see that this decision is really only provided for me. And uh, the enemy's decision is made for them. They automatically poke. There's no ability for them to decide. But <clears throat> take a look at how much work, how many lines of code this whole process of making the decision is. So there's two ways to look at this. You could put this into a method inside the main class and call it, or you could put it into the player class and let the player manage their own um, process of taking a move. Now, normally you want to avoid having the player class do any input or output. But just for the sake of a demonstration here, I'm going to take um, the process of moving sort of each player taking their turn, I should say, maybe not a move, um, but their turn. I'm going to take the process of taking the turn and move it into the player class. So I'm going to take all of this action here and I'm going to cut it. And we're going to move it into the player class. Now this immediately becomes troublesome because a lot of the variables that we defined in the main class aren't available in the player class. Really simple ones are things like um, I don't have a scanner defined, I don't have this keyboard defined. So inside of my um, inside of my player class I might go ahead and define a scanner so that I have it for use. If I'm going to actually do some of the control of the input and output in here, then there's nothing wrong with defining a scanner um, globally so that I can reuse it. Okay, so that'll get rid of my keyboard error right here. But the problem is that <clears throat> you can see here that me and enemy are no longer defined, and that makes perfect sense. Um, this player class doesn't know anything about the names of the objects that get created from it. What we want to do is replace all the instances of me with this. Now, Control R is what allows you to easily refactor things. So if I press Control R, you see we get an error message here, though, because it doesn't know how to refactor the me because the me is never actually declared. So to get around this, you can really quickly just define me. And now, since it's defined, you can refactor it and I'm going to call it this. Because what we want to do is when a player takes a turn it's this player's name that's poking the other player. It's this player who's poking that other player. It's this player's name. It's this player's patience pack that we're going to use. So we use the this modifier uh, to figure out which object's method to call. Now the problem here is that we don't have any concept of who the enemy is that they're taking the turn against. So we need to make sure that when we call take turn, we are passing in who they're taking their turn against. So if I just define enemy here, then enemy is defined inside of the, um, inside of the method. I'm just going to clean this up a little bit so you can see it more clearly. So now the idea of taking a turn is encapsulated inside 
of a method inside the player class. And it kind of makes sense it should be inside the player class because it's the player who takes a turn against another player. In this case, we call it the enemy. So I'm just going to quickly comment this. Okay, so it's exactly the same functionality. We've just given it to the player class inside of a method called take turn. So back in my main class now, I can say, well, to start off, I'd like the me object to run the take turn method. And you can see it automatically throws enemy in there. So I'm going to take a turn against the enemy. And now instead of having to write, rewrite that code all down here, I can just say, well, let's have the enemy take a turn against me. And so now if I run this, both players should be able to make choices. Now, one thing that's weird about my NetBeans installation is occasionally it won't take input from me the first time I run. So it's not listening to me, so I just have to stop and rerun it. So if you see me doing that during the demos, that's why. OK, so I'll pick P to poke. Now, Mr. Pearson might see that he's really down patience pack, so he might decide to use a patience pack right off the bat there. That's better. I'll poke. Poke. Um, Mr. Pearson sees that his patience is going down, so he probably wants to use a patience pack. That's better. Okay, so now we have a much more interactive game where people can take turns. You can see the result, and uh, all that was really easily encapsulated inside of the player class. Now, one thing I would one thing I would change here in this take turn method is I would actually print out the name of the player who's making the decision. So that you understand whose turn it is. So now let's take a look. Right, so here you can see it's saying, okay, Mr. Prowse, what would you like to do? And in fact, to make this even clearer, I would probably like to um, print out a new line right at the beginning. There we go. Okay, so that looks a little bit better. So that's a really simple game. Um, and now when I look at it, I realize we're not really using the score. So um, I might just get rid of the score member. So I'm going to delete score. I'm going to go down and find my get score and set score. And we'll just get rid of those because we're not going to use them. And we're ready to go with some of our object-oriented concepts that'll apply to this game.